Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening if you're watching us uh, from Switzerland. Good afternoon and good morning to those of you who are in the U.S. Uh, we're broadcasting live from uh, the New York City outpost of Swiss Next Boston. Uh, welcome to this webinar. It is the, the last in a series of uh, instructional webinars uh, that are designed to assist Swiss startups in their discovery and their uh, potential entry into the U.S. market. Today's topic will be uh, the media vector, how to leverage New York City's dense media scene to your startup's advantage. Um, and uh, for that purpose, we have two uh, eminent guests here, Bonnie Halper from AliWatch and Fabian Fortmuller uh, from Holsti. Uh, but before I introduce you more fully, I'm gonna say just a few words about who we are and what we do. Um, SwissNext is an initiative of uh, the State uh, Secretariat for Education, Research and Innovation in Switzerland. And uh, we run, uh, we've run for the last seven years, a series of camps that are designed for Swiss startups uh, to enter into the US market. These camps are anywhere from one to three months, depending on the specific nature of its validation or market entry. We offer free of charge uh, a number of services, including expert advice, coaching, workshops, networking opportunities, and also importantly, a workspace in three locations. Uh, the SwissNext locations in uh, Boston, in San Francisco, and the uh, New York City Outpost, which was opened uh, a little over a year ago. These uh, accelerator programs are one of the components of our partnership with uh, CTI, the Swiss Commission on Technology and Innovation. The other component is this educational series of webinars. Uh, this is the, the last in, uh, in uh, several webinars we've had this year. I encourage you to go visit uh, all the websites of SwissNext as well as our uh, YouTube channel in order to see these instructional videos. Um, today's conversation is uh, an interesting one, I hope, for you. Um, the, the New York City landscape is, is quite dense and Swiss companies may find it a little bit daunting to navigate. Um, so uh, in order to, to allow uh, Swiss startups to, to really fully take a good grasp of, of this landscape, we have two expert guests. Uh, I just want to say that you will be able to ask some questions um, to our, our panelists today. You can use the, uh, the chat function on the right side of your screen. Uh, we also have a Twitter uh, handle that you can address questions to. Uh, so today I'm really delighted uh, to have our two guests, Bonnie Halper, your editor-in-chief of AliWatch. Uh, it's an online publication that uh, has a wealth of really timely and in-depth news about uh, all things startup in, uh, in New York Silicon Alley. And Fabian Fortmüller, you're a Swiss entrepreneur who's been in, in New York for several years now. You're the co-founder of Holsti, which is uh, a startup that creates uh, products and, ex and experiences for an ex inspired life and that also hosts a number of events uh, at its co-working uh, space in Brooklyn. Um, I'm going to start with you, Fabian. Um, Holsti is a fascinating space because it has roots in a very specific desire to have a physical product. Uh, at first, it, it's a t-shirt, and then a, a manifesto appeared that really went viral. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you started um, to gain attention from people over the internet and then uh, from the media? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for the introduction. So, um, we started as a product company. We made physical products, t-shirts, that's where the name Holsey comes from. Holsey stands for our first product, which was a t-shirt that had a pocket here on the side with a little, that looked like a holster. So if you take a holster and a t-shirt, it becomes Holsey. And um, what, what we did is that we knew that we wanted to build a different startup than we've done in the past. I've been an entrepreneur most of my life. and. I feel that sometimes when you build things, you forget why you're doing them while you're in the midst of it. Because it's crazy and lots of stuff goes on and, and you know, there's kind of startup life. Mm -hmm. And we, together with my two co-founders, we wanted to define why are we doing this? And how do we know that we're successful? So in order to define success in non-monetary terms, we wrote ourselves a manifesto. Um, and that became kind of the whole Steam manifesto. And we can and see it actually on the on the screen right now. Uh, awesome. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen it, uh, and some of you might have it on your your bedroom walls or your boardroom walls as well. So, yeah. Yeah, and so what ended up happening is that we, the manifesto, we put it up on our website. Um, we had it there for maybe half a year or a year, and at first nobody really cared about it, but then it started to travel virally um, at some point, and we can maybe go into it a little bit like what kicked that off. Mm -hmm. um, 
um, and um, we turned from a product brand to a lifestyle brand. While at the beginning we were on a mission to make beautiful, sustainably produced goods, we realized what we really are is our mission is to help people lead that lifestyle. By then, did you already have a strong public presence, or was that emerging at that point? No, that just came out. I mean, we we honestly got just very fortunate with one of our um, one of our products going viral. Mm -hmm. It happens to be that's a very visual product, mm -hmm. um, and I think also we're probably one of the few companies in the world whose mission statement has gone viral. Right. Um, oh, absolutely. And yeah. and I think as um, for us, our rule has always been that there's no better way to communicating than through values. Mm -hmm. That we think that an authentic, genuine way of, of communicating is the best way of marketing, um, the best best way of branding. And so, as a result, kind of also our our manifesto became our business card, mm -hmm. um, and has traveled all over the world. And the first media attention, how did that happen? I, I know you've been um, profiled at length, for example, on uh, uh, New York Public Radio. There's been a really interesting report about Holsti. How did that happen? Yeah, so I think for us, um, we don't know anything about media. Now, I can learn a lot from, from Bonnie here, I'm sure. So, but what we knew is that in the end of the day, we believe that everything is relationships. Mm -hmm. Everything we do, that's our that's kind of our hypothesis. And um, at the beginning, when we started out, we didn't even dare to contact journalists because we felt that was out of our reach. So we just started to talk to people who were kind of close to us and that were bloggers. Mm -hmm. And there is, um, in particular, two bloggers that really made Holsey the company we are today. Mm -hmm. uh, one is a, a Swiss design blogger called Swiss Miss, mm -hmm. Tina Roth, here in, in, uh, in New York. She's Swiss, we have that in, in common, and just... She's been always like a huge source of inspiration for, for me personally, um, and we built a personal relationship there. Second blogger is Maria Popova from Brain Pickings, uh, Brain Pickings on Door, amazing blog. And there again, also, we just were early on, um, the blogs weren't yet that huge as they are today. And both of them picked up um, the manifesto and put it out, and that helped us kind of to get, mm. get it out there. And, and then that combined with being very present on social media helped um, get the word out there. So at the beginning, funny enough, Tumblr was very important for us. Yeah. Um, Twitter was very important for us, which both of those channels now are not that big anymore for us personally. Now Facebook is much, much more, Instagram and Facebook are much more important. Um, but at the beginning, like those two bloggers kicked us off mm -hmm. and, and then Tumblr kind of took it to the next level. It's interesting because you mentioned your hesitancy to contact media directly and, and that's actually an interesting segue. Bonnie, do you get contacted by startups directly? How often does it happen? And is it likely for you to produce a story out of some of these contacts? Well, we, we encourage New York startups to contact us directly. And so we even have a little link on our site. Absolutely, we want to know what you're doing. We want to know who you are. Why wouldn't we want to? And why wouldn't you want to promote yourselves? But make sure you're ready. Make sure you're ready. That's that's key. That's a key component. Yes, think. have a story. You know, have a story. What are you doing? What's different about it? What inspired you to do this? This is what people want to know. Mm -hmm. And are there cases where you have a, a startup that has a, a very interesting way of of reaching out to you? Something that surprised you? Uh, do you have any interesting anecdotes from that respect? Oh, there was this. <coughs> there was this one startup. Actually, they're they're two French guys. And they had a, a flower startup. It was roses. It's called Ode a la, Ode a la Rose. Ode a la Rose. So I'm in the office, and one day these flowers arrive. These beautiful, this huge box of flowers arrive. <laughs> like, what, what is this? And I open it up. Sure enough, they were for me. They mm -hmm. were not for my husband. I'm like, <laughs> and I look at it, and I see that it's Ode a la Rose. And they do have an interactive component. The roses were beautiful, and their presentation was unusual in that it was in a mason jar. And I love mason jars. Like, this is something I can use again. I don't need another vase. And uh, there was a link, and there's a video. You could somebody can do a video, a special video message to the person, the recipient of the rose. They got my attention. So it was both inventive, and at the same time, it got your attention. And you wrote, and so you wrote a story about the story. They're beautiful. Rose. They were fabulous roses uh -huh. too. Okay, well that's that. You know, so maybe that's always. Uh, it makes sense if you're a flower company. I don't know if it's the type of advice that every single startup should should have, but it's. I think it's important to have, to be a little bit original. It is. Um, and. Uh, you know, there's another aspect, obviously, in which you also alluded to, uh, Fabian, is, is the relationship building, the networking. Now, I know that you go to a lot of events as well. Do you get people uh, pitching to you directly, or are they also hesitant? What's what's your, how does the networking happen? There are two kinds of entrepreneurs. There are entrepreneurs who are like right in your face. Mm -hmm. They're confident. I think these are the people who get funded. In fact, <laughs> there was... Um, one young entrepreneur who would go to every single networking event, talk to every single um, 
investor there, <clears throat> everywhere. He was out every single night. Mm -hmm. And an investor who I knew did invest in him. And I said, you know, I'm surprised this really isn't your sweet spot. And he said, you know, he was bugging me just so much. I wanted it. I invested in him just to get rid of him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, and then there's the kinds who are like almost apologetic. Don't mm -hmm. apologize. You, you have confidence in your startup. Get out there. Get, you know, tell the message. Tell me what you're doing. I want to know. And what inspired you? Always have a story. In fact, if you're pitching, when you're pitching the press, you should have three stories, three ways of presenting your startup. Ah, okay. So what, tell us a little bit about those three ways. Do they have to be distinct, or do they, is it three anecdotes, or is it do they have to have three separate uh, ways of telling the same story? Three ways of uh, presenting a story. Different reporters cover different things, and okay. you don't know what's going to strike a chord with whichever journalist or reporter. So always have three ways of pitching your story, and they might be working on a story that. That's right in line with what you're doing. So. Mm -hmm. This is what you're saying that you should you should tell the reporter, look, here are three stories, or you pick one before you tell the story. No, well, so, what some people do is you know they'll start telling you what they're doing, and then when they see that they don't have your attention, they'll switch gears. Mm. They see what resonates with someone, mm. and different things resonate with different writers and different reporters. Yes. How do you decide which uh, you know? For example, if there's a, a I don't know if there's a period in the year that's a little bit drier from the startup world. How do you then decide? Uh, in New uh, York, there's never a there's dry never period. a dry moment. <laughs> no, there's a net, there are at least five networking events every night, and you should go out and network and talk to people. Don't just go get drink and get drunk. Mm -hmm. That's not why you're there. You want to meet people. You want to talk to people and find out what they're doing. How about if um, a startup feels that they're not particularly comfortable, or they they think they've got a great product, but that they don't really know how to pitch it to people? Is um, is it can it be useful to use uh, a PR professional in, in those uh, instances? And do you get do you get a lot of interactions with with PR people as well? There are PR people who approach us all the time. Sometimes ad nauseum, and it's it's over the top. But sometimes they do their do you you find professionals that do their job uh, in a way that assists the startup. Yes. Do, yeah, do you do you like to listen to? P I mean, if if you get a same story from if you get an equal story from a PR agency or from a director from a startup, do you prefer to have it from the startup? It it or depends necessary? on the, it depends on what the story is. You know, mm. I got something today from a PR agency, and it was just a few sentences, but they got my interest. Mm. Ah, okay, interesting. Um, I, I want to ask you a little bit about about Silicon Alley. Uh, so you know, for those of you who who are joining us from Switzerland, Silicon Alley is the the moniker that designs, uh, you know, by uh, association with Silicon Valley in California, Silicon Alley is the part of New York, generally where our co-working space uh, is is located. So around downtown, the Twenty Third Street and below, there are a lot of startups in New York. Um, do you find that the the, the journalists from the tech sector uh, that cover sorry that cover the tech sector in New York, do you find that they're uh, as locally focused as, for example, the journalists on the West Coast are on uh, on that part of, of the U.S. in the tech sector. Well, there's so much going on in New York. They're not all specifically focused on Silicon Alley, which is why we did uh, Alley Watch, because mm -hmm. we decided this is going to be about Silicon Alley. This is going to be about startups in New York, what they're doing, who's getting funding, who the investors are, the angels, the VCs, just everything that covers entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. In the New York ecosystem. In the New York ecosystem. Do you, um, you know, one of the interesting aspects for us is, is coming from, from uh, Europe, from Switzerland. Um, do you get a little bit of buzz about uh, what goes on on the other side of the ocean? Uh, and is that does that occasionally attract your attention? It, well, a lot of companies, there are different events, and some of them, they do host companies who are coming over from other countries. Mm -hmm. Some of them do establish a New York presence, too. Mm -hmm. I have a question for both of you, actually. Um, one of the things that uh, we see often with respect to Swiss startups is uh, they, traditionally, a lot of people in Switzerland have relied on the excellence of the product that they sell, and in, in, in effect, to sell itself. And uh, it may not seem as second nature uh, to be able to promote actively what it is that you're doing. Um, so what what advice would you give to uh, startups in Switzerland who come here and want to gain a little bit of traction in the media, in the public? Um, what are some of the, the, the pitfalls or some of the, the risks that uh, uh, someone might run into if, they, if, they're, do, if they're not doing it in a way that's you know, uh, thoughtful and, and uh, over a good strategy? Don't keep it a secret. You have to talk about what you're doing. Talk to everybody. You never know who you're talking to. I mean, unless you're looking for press or an investor, you just never, or you know, maybe a partnership, or 
You never know who you're talking to, but you can't keep it a secret. You can't keep it a secret. Can't keep, and a lot of people do. It's like, <laughs> is this a secret? They do. They're too shy to talk about it. Well, you know, you must believe in your product. Why don't you want to talk about it? Tell me what you're doing. How about when uh, the nature of what you have changes a little bit? I mean, you, uh, you, you pivoted a little bit with Holstie. There was, oh, massively, yeah. Um, and how do you weave that pivot? Because that happens to a lot of uh, startups. That Almost they start with something, and at one point, uh, that something morphs into something else. Um, how do you convey that in a way that seems like it's natural and it's uh, good, as opposed to you know scrambling for, for uh, a new strategy? Yeah, I mean, in our case, I think first of all, like you, you switching and, and finding your way, something very natural in the startup world that also I assume the journals know just as much as we do. That's kind of part of reality of, of, of evolution of any startup. And I think I, I personally have a slightly different approach maybe to Bonnie in this case, where I, I believe that when it comes to media, when it comes to investors, when it comes to all these things, I think the true value comes in building long term relationships. Um, and that. Um, that it's really about um, if you want to have an example, um, uh, a Swiss example actually. A friend of mine, um, Thierry Blompe, he's a he's a Swiss entrepreneur. He runs a, a font company. They make digital fonts, um, sell them online, and um, and I think what he's done is that over the last couple of years, every time he goes somewhere, he goes and says hello to the design agencies and to the designers. Um, and he just really invests a lot of time in those relationships. Um, when he's there in person, in person, otherwise on the internet, they follow each other on Twitter, they retweet each other, they like, they they have a lot of interactions. Um, and you know, those things don't pay off in the short term. And I, I personally would not, don't advise to expect that they will um, pay off in the short term. But in in two three years, I think a lot of things can come out of that. And now, you know. Who are the people sell, buying his funds? All the people he met uh, on his journeys and been keeping mm. in touch. And like, you don't need to be based in New York City to do that. Um, and I think the same thing has been for us that, you know, when the uh, the NPR story that came about Holsey came from mm. someone we knew quite well, but it wasn't that person; it was someone else. And it mm. was a long-term relationship that, you know, at some point, like, was the right moment. Um, and so I, I just, I would encourage to. Um, even if you're not in in New York, just start investing into relationships. Come here, like meet some people, keep in touch with them, like keep them updated. Um, and and um, you know we all use the same digital tools. There's so many ways to keep in touch besides just like uh, physical. So. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that uh, long-term relationships. But that's what I say when you go out and network, and mm -hmm. you are meeting the people again and again. But that's okay. And in fact, when you talk about follow-up, there's a very funny story about uh, Fred Wilson and Boxy. Avner Ronan, the founder of Boxy, I don't know if you know the story. No, I don't know, but so Fred Wilson is it's a Union famous Square. investor here in New York, Union Square Ventures. Yes. He, and, he and his uh, spouse are, have been longtime investors. So she's an angel investor, okay. Joanne Wilson's an angel investor. So Boxy, Avner Ronan decided that Fred Wilson and Union Square Ventures were going to invest in him, and so he pitched Fred and Fred said no. Abner would follow up with him every single month. He would send him an update of what was going on with Boxy, what traction they had. And every single month, the answer came back, no. <laughs> for 18 months, Abner did this every single month for 18 months until he heard yes. In fact, and Union Square Ventures didn't invest in Boxy. Now, do you have the same degree of patience? Or is it all business and if you're pitched month after month after month a story? But this was, he was pitching, he was giving updates, trash, and he was giving real information. So there was real information. Yes. So you can't pitch the same thing. No, you can't. You, I, I, okay. That's an interesting, uh, that's an important, I think, uh, takeaway for, for companies. Uh, and at one stage, you decide that it passes a th the, the threshold for making it worthy of your interest and of perhaps an article. Yes. Yes. Are, have any startups been extremely persistent with you um, and gotten uh, some traction after a while? Well, we're, we're very open to startups and we're yeah. happy to cover them anyway. Yeah. Especially if you're doing something interesting or fun or unique. It's another dating app. Okay, there are a lot of dating apps out there. Now, both of you um, work in, in spaces that have other, um, you know, a few other professionals. Uh, in, in your case, Bonnie, you're actually in the same co working space that Swissness is, uh, co workers here on, uh, in, 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 uh, near the Flatiron. Um, is it important uh, to have that type of environment? And also for you, Fabian, to have a space 
uh, that's dedicated, that's open. Um, I don't know, if, perhaps we've seen a few photos circulate uh, that show the, the co-working space. I think we're showing it right now. Um, there are events. Uh, what's the, the social component, the, the ability to have a physical space with people around you, that's kind of a relatively new phenomenon. Although we're in cities that have been quite crowded, but in your in your both of your lines of business, it's quite important in order to establish relationships. I like working in a co-working space and seeing with all the different startups. I mean, this is a co-working space with three different floors, and there are a lot of different companies. And mm -hmm. another thing that I like about this co-working space is that they do have the weekly cocktail party, so you get to meet other people, and there are a lot of meetups here, mm -hmm. so you get to see what people outside are doing. And they're usually hosted by somebody here, whether it's a marketing agency or a PR agency. Or mm -hmm. And Fabian, you have social events that are also kind of food uh, related as well, right? Yeah, we have a we have a big space in Brooklyn um, that during the day is our office, and in the evenings and on the weekends is kind of a community space, event space. And um, I think one thing we've learned is also it's always a good uh, it's it's always good to have a great reason to invite someone because in New York City you meet so many interesting people. Um, and if you have a strong reason to connect with them beyond just pitching your your startup. Um, or beyond maybe pitching your startup, um, that's really valuable. And so what we've done is actually, even before we had an office, we, we started cooking dinner every two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, it used to be in our tiny bedroom, one bedroom apartment, two bedroom apartment, then we moved to a bigger apartment in East Village, and now we have kind of bigger space in Brooklyn. But th the concept was always very simple. We just would cook every two weeks, and all the interesting people we would meet be like, hey, do you want to meet other interesting people? Every two weeks we bring them together. And that was a great way for us to bring out the brand, build relationships, and build trust. Because you know, after you spend a whole evening together and, and sharing food and, and nice conversations, I think the the relationship goes from from a very professional relationship to also a personal one. And, and I think that's where we think in the in the long term is is the is the value. Mm -hmm. And I like the smaller networking events too. In fact, every month here at Coworkers, I host a breakfast with a different investor. Mm -hmm. So it's it's one investor, it could be an angel investor, and if they're active angel investors, active VCs, and 20 to 25 people, so it's small enough so that everybody can have breakfast and talk. And you'd be surprised because that's how you build relationships, because mm -hmm. you're getting to know everybody one-on-one, -on -one. they're getting to know you. And even though it's supposed to be an hour and a half, because people have to get off to work, every single investor has stayed at least three or four hours, because they just the conversation starts, you never know where it's going to go, and it's, it's smaller networking events are good as well when they're focused. Those are very good because then you do get to establish a one-on-one -on -one relationship with somebody who might really help your startup in the long term or the short term. And uh, occasionally those generate stories for you all as well. I mean, you've got interesting conversations. It might spark an idea and, and then an article. It, that's true. You never. It's always interesting to hear what the, what the startups are doing. And when they're in a small space like that, and it seems it's very intimate, They'll just talk about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting because every single investor has something. You know, you hear investors looking for this, this, this. They all have a different sort of focus and they'll all be open to a Q&A. And what comes out of the Q&A is really interesting because it always shifts the entire conversation. Mm -hmm. It pivots the conversation. It pivots the conversation. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Q&A, we're, we're going to continue the conversation, but uh, we welcome any question that you might have. Again, you can use the, the chat box on the right of your screen. Uh, there will be a few questions uh, very shortly that uh, I'll start uh, asking to our panelists. Um, but uh, I, one last question I wanted to, to, to ask uh, of both of you, and I don't know if you've had experiences where perhaps the news that a startup might have is not as good. Um, how, does a, you know, wh how does a startup deal with bad press? And uh, how do you deal with news when you see a startup, for example, a startup that you've liked, something bad that happens to it or it doesn't make it or or their product is a, is a failure. Um, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. Well, the press are always looking for stories and sometimes the negative stories are real, sometimes they're not. You know, co-founders leave, co-founders are kicked out. There are different reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's always three sides to every story, this side or side and the truth. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think there's also something to say that even in the moments where you might not have a lot of growth to show or not a lot, um, you know, like the most obvious stories are usually around growth or like a new product, etc. Um, we found that there's still possibilities to create awesome stories about just having having good initiatives or good mm -hmm. campaigns. So we did, for example, um, I think 2013 for us was not a very strong year. We didn't grow uh, very strongly. Um, 
but we did a big campaign around uh, Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving in the US is a day, big day of consumption. And so we did a campaign called Block Friday, uh, where we encouraged people to, instead of consuming and going out and buying more stuff, um, to take time off and block time off to spend time with their family and we did a, we did a whole video campaign etc that that got us a lot of um, attention which was really was very topic focused um, and it was not necessarily about our growth which then helped mm. us again to grow um, one question I uh, saw just briefly here was has to do with uh, press releases uh, is that still is there a still a, a standard format for how a press release must be produced by a startup uh, and can you do you read between the lines when you see the when you get a, a press release and, and then I'll pivot to you and ask you if you if you've written the press releases of, you know recently or have, have they changed in the past? You know, I used to work in the music industry, and one of my one of the things I used to do, have to do was write press releases, and they're all that standard format, and they are dead boring. Most reporters are really busy. Don't just write. Oh, we're so happy that blah blah. But the standard language that everybody uses, big yawn. Write a story. Then it inspires the reporter. Oh my God, that's the story. You're almost doing their job for them. Of course, they're going to follow up and go more into Don't write the standard press release. We're sick of it. You're not going to get my attention. It's going to be like, oh God. <laughs> Another one for the pile. Even though it's all an email, I understand that. It's still within the pile. And I mean, have, have, do you, have you written traditional, ra rather traditional press releases, or have you changed the, your approach towards them? Yeah, we actually am not. Sh we, we are still figuring that out. Um, we, to be very honest, like we've never done a classical press releases. When we've done them, we didn't see much reaction to it. What we, what we've been very good at is uh, we have like a what we call an influencer newsletter. People who we've been close with, we keep them updated on a regular basis in a, in a personalized email mm -hmm. um, with like some of the new things going on or maybe an exciting story, a bigger campaign. Um, but we, we, we tend to almost formulate it in a, in a, in a very personal way um, and not make it seem like it's kind of a press release. But having said that, we heard from other startups who do kind of the press release thing and that, that still seems to work in some capacities as well. So mm -hmm. um, the kind of more send send one email with like 5,000 BCC addresses or something. Uh, we've never really done that, but I don't, I'm not saying that this doesn't work. We just haven't really like mm -hmm. um, figured that out. Uh, another question um, we received was um, essentially when a when a startup is specialized in an area that might be a niche area. So, for example, Holsti has one of the advantages of Holsti with respect to a, the, a public facing um, approach is that there is a public facing component of your business that is integral to your mission. But if your um, if your startup is, for example, a medical device or something that perhaps is less uh, media um, attracting. How do you how do you go about w with a media strategy? Well, there are different publications. The different publications cover different verticals. Mm -hmm. Publications that cover health, medical devices. I mean, Ali Watch happens to be you know, a first read of investors, and mm -hmm. so we'll cover everything because we know that there are investors who are looking at things across the board, and mm -hmm. one of them might be biotech or medical devices. But look for the bloggers and the the publications that are covering that that vertical. Do you find uh, that bloggers are um, that the line between bloggers and journalists is still exists, or or um, is it now a, sort of a continuum? And does that matter for a startup in terms of who they have to uh, pitch to? I mean, we on our side always been very focused on bloggers because we found them more approachable. Mm -hmm. um, but that might also be a, a gap that has been closing because like they got less attention in the beginning and now probably been getting more and more attention over the over last few years. And I mean, some of these bloggers have millions of readers a month. So mm -hmm. it's like they are newspapers in their or like, you know, media channels in, in their very own right. Um, we found that journalists definitely have just the, the, sl the, the tone and the approach tends to be a little bit, a little bit more formal sometimes. Mm -hmm. Or maybe that's just our perception. Maybe that's not what we should do. But um, in, in our case, we've definitely had more success with bloggers and more focus on bloggers because we found that um, people still tend to live, give them a little bit less attention and less mm -hmm. uh, uh, appreciation than, than journalism. We, we, for us, that, that turned out to be a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, bloggers do have huge followers and they have become influencers and there are reporters who follow those bloggers. So if you do want to 
you do want to focus on those bloggers and try to get their attention and approach them. Mm -hmm. They they want to hear about what you're doing because that's what interests them the most. They are the influencers. There's a question um, here in our chat box uh, from uh, that has to do with sort of the intermediaries uh, between a startup uh, and a uh, and a publication. The question is, do you think that using a, a partner, an official partner in this case, like Swiss Next or CTI? or some from other countries or, or um, other accelerator programs can help build up credibility <coughs> to get media coverage. Absolutely, because we love to cover accelerators. We know that they're, it's not easy. I just did a piece on the new Techstars accelerator and applications were up 60% and 0.08% of the applic applicants actually got in. So there is a vetting process there. We'd like to know who they are, who got in. Mm -hmm. And then we always go to the demo day. We always want to see where they started, where they, how far they've come. And a lot of them pivot. A lot of them pivot. A of them and pivot. a lot of them get better yes. um, as they learn the skills. They get refined, they get, they learn how to market, they learn how to build a product. It really is an accelerator, it really is a trajectory. Um, Bonnie, if, if it's the right accelerator, if, if it's want, right, okay. you do want to get into the good accelerators. Yeah. Not all accelerators are the same. Are there good ones in uh, in New York? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe we offline, uh, you might have some recommendations yeah. to specific uh, questions. And the um, accelerators are open to anybody from anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. In fact, the uh, one I just covered the new uh, Techstars class, and they're in from, I believe, Amsterdam, no, Australia, Brisbane, mm -hmm. Paris, they're from all over, all over the world. Uh, another question for Bonnie, uh, what about other fo forms of media like uh, video and podcasts? Uh, is that something that, uh, that you use? Um, I have a really short attention span. I yeah. really do. I can't sit there and watch an hour-long podcast. I'm busy. I don't understand why, why they go so long. Mm -hmm. and have you have you used podcasts in the past? Uh, not podcasts, but video has been very successful for us as a, as a medium. I mean, we um, we have a couple million views on, on YouTube, and I think that has been a very big driver um, for us. We also believe that video, just on social, uh, starts to do really well now that in Facebook um, videos are integrated into the feed with autoplay mm -hmm. um, we've seen very good kind of um, reactions to that um, they don't convert um, that well into into uh, traffic on your site and mm -hmm. the conversion from from YouTube um, or, or like Facebook videos onto uh, your own site is, is lower but we've definitely had, very, for us, it's been a very good medium. Uh, maybe not necessarily in terms of driving direct traffic, but definitely in terms of brand building. Mm -hmm. And I have gotten things from startups who are who want a story, and there will be a short little video. And if they're amusing, entertain, and really tell the story, got me. So a picture is worth a thousand words yes, in that respect. Or a video is worth or, or, or a video, <laughs> or 30, 30 uh, pictures per second, yes. I guess. Uh, another question for Bonnie. Did you ever publish an article about a promising company that turned out as a complete flop. And how did you handle that? Did you ever get uh, negative feedback on, on an article in, in that respect? Or? Have we covered a company that's been a complete mm -hmm. flop? Well, there have been some companies that have gone through accelerators that you know they don't always mm -hmm. pan out. And I have no control over that. Mm -hmm. But we've been pretty good at picking good companies. In fact, a lot of companies, well, because as I said, we are first read of investors. A lot of them will do the article and, of course, the, and because we are boots on the ground, we're out there at events all the time. So we're finding startups that, you know, larger, more well-known publications might uh, miss mm -hmm. time around. So they'll get picked up there. They'll get picked up by the larger publications. And one of the questions we always ask is, if you could talk to one investor in New York, who would it be and why? And you'd be surprised how often the investors follow up. They do. They do. They, companies have gotten funded that way. Uh, that's that's definitely encouraging for any company that uh, is watching us. Uh, I'm going to see if there are any additional questions. Um, I myself, I'm I'm always interested in uh, the various aspects that um, you know go into the process of, of writing a story, and I've, I was very happy that you covered the, those aspects uh, in detail about what makes a story exciting. Um, are there other on the flip side? Are there pitfalls? Uh, that should be avoided when uh, we're uh, a startup that is uh, talking to uh, a media outlet. You know, one thing, I th th this is a pet peeve of mine because when, I'll, when I get the information or I'm talking to somebody, and of course I'm going to go back to your site and I'm going to see what you're doing. You'd be surprised at how many people, I read their site and I'm, it takes me a while to figure out exactly what you're doing. Hire a real writer. This is your first line. This is, the pre this is what you're presenting to the world. Hire a real writer who knows how to tell your story. 
And you'd be surprised at how many startups I've covered. And I'll go to events and they'll come up to me and they'll say, you know, you did a great story. In fact, we took your piece and we put it in our deck and we got funded. I guess people are so close that they don't know how to tell their story. They don't know how to present it to the public. How do you find writers um, if you're, you know, coming to New York for the first time? Where, what's the typical pool you would look uh, for of, of uh, competent writers? That's a hard one. I don't know. Yeah. And, I mean, if you go to Brooklyn, there uh, there's a whole creative class of, of talented writer, but uh, there must be You don't think that we have <laughs> talented writers in the Of course, of course, yeah. Um, have you, and you, you've got some native writers in, in, uh, in a lot of you are creative uh, by, by, you know, by trade uh, within Holsti. I mean, you, you uh, write a lot of your copy yourself, I guess. Yeah, we do. We have one lady on our team right now who uh, does most of our editorial work. We have like an online magazine mm -hmm. um, we, um, that um, started to do really well, I think, the last quarter. Um, and um, she's been writing most of it. But we are actually hiring writers. So um, if, you're, if you're interested in a job as a writer, we're looking for editors. Uh, we're building out our content team. Um, and um, we're working on our first book. And so we're, we're definitely interested to use that because I, for us, creating our own content has been a great way of getting out there, getting publicity and getting, mm -hmm. getting attention. Um, so yeah, All there's, right. a, there's a great website called Contently if you're looking for, for to, to hire writers. I forgot about that. I have another, no. I have another uh, question, Fabian, it's a follow-up. You were talking about videos and that they are working for you and that you get a lot of attention. How much um, are you spending on these? Um, depends on the video. We we spend about between thousand five hundred to five thousand dollars on a on a video. Um, that's kind of roughly the production cost. Um, another question, also for for you, Fabian. How uh, difficult is it for a, a Swiss entrepreneur uh, to compete with uh, Americans? Uh, do you have any tips? Of course, you you've been here for a while, and your partners are from uh, from the air oh, from the U.S. at least. Uh, but do you. Do you have any tips for somebody who might just be coming over? I don't think I don't think we are at any disadvantage for being foreign. I mean, this country is very very open to um, to foreigners, especially in the startup world. I think people are pretty agnostic where you're from. I think I think you, you're going to be challenged on your idea and, and, and assessed on your idea. Um, um, one thing I've learned, and that's just a, I guess a culture thing that has been said many times, is that I think um, just I think Americans, the way that they grew up, were used to think bigger. Um, and I, 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 rem I remember when I was raising my first round of investment, I would think about maybe I raise 100,000 bucks or, you know, 200,000 bucks. And Americans always think with like in millions or, you know, like they always, I just like my, my learning has been, I always try to add a zero or two um, to get to kind of the American way of thinking, which is, you know, like shoot, shoot, shoot for, for the stars. And, and, um, and that's, I think, something just culturally that I've, I've learned over time because in Switzerland things are, you know, you, 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 you. I don't know even with budgets or projections, you know, Swiss projections are very conservative and they're like realistic somewhat, etc. And it's like that's not how the startup world works mm -hmm. here. It's like people have big dreams and they they put them out there. And I think not not being afraid of like dreaming really big. Um, um, I think that's also that's what you need to compete to some extent, mm -hmm. um, because otherwise you're just gonna sell yourself short. What you said before. And people do tend to uh, raise more because you want you want to raise the round and you want to get to work. You don't want to have to raise another round right away. Mm -hmm. So actually, investors encourage that you raise larger rounds. Lage, uh, raise larger rounds. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, one last question I had, um, pivoting on some some questions that we received. Um, Swiss, there are Swiss journalists in uh, New York City. Um, do you? Give uh, you know when you when you put out uh, some something new at Holstein, do you also ha are mindful of what a Swiss audience might uh, uh, be interested in in hearing? We've never really actively looked for that, but honestly, we've just I think because there are not that many Swiss in New York City. Whenever there is a story about Swiss in in New York City, they somehow end up with like. The couple of Swiss people who are here, so we've gotten a good uh, like in I know Tagesanzeige or Bilanz or Schweizer Illustrierte kind of couple of like publications like that um, in Switzerland have done things about us. Um, 
I think not necessarily because we were very proactive at it, but because there is not that many people to cover. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so we've been, um, we got nothing, the, the luck and the fortune of, of, of that, yeah. Mm-hmm. I have another question for you. Uh, Fabian, any plans to market in Europe? Yeah, for sure. We are actually 50% of our revenue already now comes from non-US markets. Um, right now, just um, a lot of our, so the way we sell right now is, is through our, our um, online site, e-commerce, and then we're in about uh, 600 stores worldwide. Um, and we, we sell really well uh, to Europe, um, but we haven't really actively worked on those markets. So we don't have a distributor yet. We don't have offices yet there, mm-hmm. um, but that's on the roadmap for the next two years. Excellent. I wanted to mention uh, one last thing. Uh, you just came back from a convention right now at the Javits Center. Uh, that's a huge event. Uh, you showed me a photo. You have a, a booth set up that looks quite a bit like your, your co-working space. Um, can you tell us just a, a couple uh, things about that? Uh? Sure, Events. absolutely. We we do th- um, we do a couple trade shows uh, a year here at the Chavez Center in New York, where you you create a booth and you show to buyers of big companies um, what you're doing, um, and you know the people from Target and Urban Outfitter and West Elm and whatnot. They come by there and look at your stuff, and um, that's just what we've been doing. And um, I, I was telling them like five days of work there is. It feels like uh, five years of work otherwise. <laughs> but it's also a great way of getting kind of your name out there and, and for us also to sell to sell products and increase distribution. I had uh, one additional question that uh, uh, for Bonnie that kind of dovetails into what we were talking about earlier. What do you see the role of, of uh, publicists uh, in, in this New York market? Do you think that they uh, that they strength, do you feel that they strengthen or weaken uh, the clients that they're pitching for? It depends on the publicist and how they, you know, I've, I've met some publicists who or worked with some public, or approached by publicists I'm happy to work with, but there are some publicists who just harangue you and bother you. Yeah, and all right. So it's and all you know, it's funny because I am female and you'd be surprised that I get some really rude male publicists and I think they would never approach a male editor-in-chief the yeah. way they approach mm. So people have to be conscious of, yeah. of these uh, pitfalls, absolutely. I'm a New York. I'm a, I'm a New Yorker. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. All right. Well, on that note, I've wanted to thank you both. This has uh, really been a fascinating conversation. Um, I want to remind our viewers that you can access all of our previous webinars on the uh, different websites for the the Swiss Next uh, offices in the U.S. Uh, they're appearing on your screen right now. We also have a YouTube channel, uh, which is also listed. Uh, There are all kinds of interesting topics which uh, you will find hopefully uh, useful in your uh, decision uh, to explore the U.S. market. Um, I want to uh, thank uh, Bonnie and and Fabian today for coming over here. I also want to uh, thank uh, the support that we received from CTI, the Swiss Commission on Technology and Innovation, as well as from the Gebert Ruf Stiftung. Um, On behalf of Bonnie and Fabian, I'm Oliver Haugen from Swissnext. Thank you, good night, and hope to see you again soon.